thank you very much, uh, Amanda, for a great talk. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, uh, I've got one in Slack here. If you can join us, uh, Amanda, if you can turn on your audio and video. Excellent. Um, so the first question in Slack is from Suvak Banerjee from uh, Apple, who says, using PEBS to track memory accesses is pretty cool. Have you thought about using this um, more generally in the kernel for virtual memory or paging applications instead of using access and dirty bits? Yeah, um, I definitely think the kernel can take this approach. Um, I mean, we, we use that uh, from the user space, but uh, the kernel can take a more global approach and use those same performance counters to make inferences about access patterns instead of scanning page tables. Awesome. Um, I think we've got a live question from uh, Adam Vile. Adam? Perhaps not. <laughs> um, let, let me, um, I've got a question myself. Um, so one thing I noticed here is that you focus quite a lot on having a, an application uh, a single application, which has basically got access to all of the DRAM and all of the NVM uh, in a socket. And then you're trying to work out how to balance things between those two different tiers. Um, have you thought about how you would extend this to sort of multiple different applications, perhaps all of whom are contending for a share uh, of DRAM and a share of NVM and may all have slightly different conflicting uh, costs and benefits to that? Uh, right, yeah. So the version of the paper uh, does only work with a single application at a time. Uh, we are currently working on extending it to support multiple applications. And the way we are uh, proposing is you have a single HEMAM global process that manages the, the pool of NVM and DRAM that individual applications will then request memory from. Um, the global HEMAM will then you know, use the same PEBS-based approach to monitor the memory behavior of those processes and either give more DRAM or take away DRAM um, to optimize performance. Um, very nice. Um, there's another question I have from uh, Slack, from uh, Sequan Lee, PhD student at UTA, so one of your colleagues. Uh, what is the benefit of classing, classifying hot cold data in both DRAM and NVM? Why not just do it more simply, for example, storing hot data to DRAM and cold data to NVM? Um, well, you don't know ahead of time necessarily what data is going to be hot or cold. Um, so you need some low overhead methods of determining that. And we, we saw that you know the page table scanning approach used in previous works doesn't scale with uh, large, the large memory capacities and has too high overhead. Um, so it's, it's a matter of like, yes, you do want your hot data in DRAM, but you have to figure out where that hot data is. Yeah, makes sense. Um, another question from Slack. Everybody's on Slack today. Um, Michael Giardino from ETX Zurich, is a postdoc. How does your migration mechanism compare to something like Linux Numa page migration? Right, so um, the, the Numa page migration um, will try to um, migrate to the local memory tier. Um, with NVM, it's a little different because like there's there's no core that's local to NVM if you're treating NVM as a separate NUMA node. So it's a bit different there. Um, the, um, the main mechanism is the same in that, you know, you have to move memory from one location to another. Um, sorry, I think it's jacked. Um, was, was there like a more specific part of that question that they wanted to know uh, I think about. it was just, I think it was a, just a general okay. comparison. Um, so do we have a live question from Adam? I, I maybe I'm doing a bad job here. I do not see that. Um, okay. Um, so one more question from uh, from Slack. Uh, Rito Ackerman from UBC, is there a point at which the transfer of pages gets completely disabled, e.g. when the working set is much, much bigger than the DRAM size? Yeah, so the migration policy decision is made when you can, you know, when there's cold DRAM pages to migrate down and hot NVM pages to migrate up. 
In the case where the hot set does not fit into DRAM, there are no D, uh, cold DRAM pages to migrate down, uh, so no migrations will occur in that case. Um, there's potentially some work to be done to make sure like the actually hottest pages are the ones that are in, in DRAM, but we don't currently make that distinction at this point. No problem. Um, let me just... Uh... Can we get this person to speak? Uh, Edward Tremel? Hi, yes. yeah. Perfect. Uh, Thank you. Just waiting my turn. Um, so it went a little fast, but in the presentation, you said that you were using this uh, PEBS mechanism to, to figure out the hot pages by sampling CPU requests for memory. Um, but as we saw in an earlier section, uh, distributed applications are now using these kernel bypass and CPU bypass uh, networking solutions. So the data that an application considers important might not be accessed as frequently by the CPU if it's being delivered by, by one of these kernel bypass, uh, say, RDMA network cards. Um, does the, the PEB system or your use of it allow you to track loads in stores that are issued by other devices like a NIC uh, other than the CPU? Right. Uh, so I, I believe the PEBs are CPU performance counters, so I don't think they would capture those uh, kernel bypass devices accessing memory. Um, that's maybe a, fe a feature that could be implemented in them. Um, to have similar performance counters. I, I don't know the state of that as well. Uh, if the RDMA hardware had a performance counter, could you incorporate that into your system? Uh, potentially, yeah, I think so. Okay, just, just something interesting to think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I don't think there are any more questions, so we'll we'll reserve things to the end of the, the session. Thank you much, very much again, Amanda. Um, and let's move on to uh, our second talk today, which is going to be uh, from uh, Anatole Lefort, who is a final year student at Telecom Sud Paris um, in Paris, France, um, and who's going to talk to us about uh, JNVM off heap persistent objects in Java. Can we please play the video there? Thank you. To remind the audience, uh, we're using Slack uh, as a way to ask questions. You can also raise your hand in Zoom if you'd like to answer, or if you'd like to ask a question live, we'll promote you. Uh, to panelists so that you can ask the question, or if you'd like to um, have us read out the question for you, please use the Slack channel to, to ask questions. And we have created threads for Mirror 2, uh, just to distinguish questions from the, the first Mirror of the session. Uh, great, and we have a question that just came up for Amanda um, by uh, Youngview Park. Uh, the question is, does um, uh, WP suspend user apps um, if, if so, then do you think you can utilize copy and write methods uh, in that case to improve the performance, especially when pages are promoted? Yeah, so the uh, write protection when we are moving pages can uh, cause applications to be paused if they wanna write to that page. However, we did observe that this is actually pretty rare. Um, so, you know, while copy and write would, could uh, potentially remove that pause. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it would affect the performance that well since we, we don't observe pauses from that scenario very often. Okay. And I, I guess another question is, did you look into uh, how NUMA topologies affect um, your, your system and uh, is it something that you consider in the work? Uh, we, we don't consider NUMA in this work. Uh, it's something we're looking at right now uh, with our ongoing work. Okay, yeah, very interesting. Um, we have another question from uh, Chao Yi, who's a master's student from USTC. Uh, and he's saying uh, persistent memory and DRAM performance is quite close, uh, but the latency gap is at the nano, because the latency gap is at the nanosecond level. Uh, is there a big benefit in placing the data on 
NVM and DRAM uh, separately? Uh, why not just put it on non-volatile memory? Uh, so the, the latencies of NVM and DRAM are close, but what, what's going to kill you with performance on NVM is the bandwidth, especially the right bandwidth. Um, we show that if you just place everything in NVM, performance can be uh, many times worse. Um, particularly if you look at our paper, the uh, results in the GAP-BS benchmark, we don't plot them, um, but we do show that, uh, we do see that the peer NVM performance is much, much worse than any of the other systems that try to tier data between the two types of memory. Actually, you mentioned um, in the talk that the paper has more details about a, another design decision uh, that considers asymmetric bandwidth in NVM. Do you want to elaborate a bit on uh, the asymmetry and uh, how it affects applications? Right. So HEMEM takes into account the asymmetric bandwidth of NVM by uh, prioritizing pages that are being written too frequently to DRAM. It does this in two ways. Uh, one, the uh, the threshold for number of PEB samples recorded to a page before it's considered hot is lower for uh, writes. Um, so we have our threshold set at eight load axes or four store axes to be considered hot. Um, additionally, if, if a page is considered hot because it met that write threshold, it gets priority uh, to for promotion to DRAM. So it gets promoted to, th those pages get promoted to DRAM before any non-write hot pages. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Um, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, one thing I'm, I'm curious about as well is, uh, so the evaluation focused on like for a single application, how uh, tiering, how using tiered memory can, can help uh, improve, improve performance. Um, have you considered how you might use HEMEM to uh, have a shared tiered memory architecture where like multiple applications can be co-located and, and sharing both the yeah, DRAM and the NVM? Uh, and how does the system already support that or what would be needed to, to extend it to those scenarios? Uh, right, yeah, so the system in the paper as described is only supports a single application at a time. Um, our ongoing work with this does uh, start looking at integrating multiple process support. And the way we've designed this so far is you have a component of HEMEM that exists as a separate process that any other processes that want to, uh, run in it with tiered memory would connect to. And this, this global HEMEM component would then uh, dole out uh, NVM or DRAM on behalf of those applications. I see, okay. Right, because uh, the, the way HEMEM is currently implemented is in user space, is that right? Okay, yes. um, so yeah, we also have, a, yeah, someone, um, uh, Youngdu is asking whether it makes sense to implement uh, this approach in the kernel and what, like, I guess maybe if you can explain sort of um, what was the design decision to do it in user space, did you consider doing it in the kernel? Um, and maybe also in light of this, like supporting multiple applications, uh, does that kind of change how you might make the decision between the two? Right, uh, so a, a kernel HEMEM uh, would have a, a more global view of all the applications by default. Um, we can achieve the same thing in user space with that setup I described earlier, where mm -hmm. um, you have a, a, a centralized HEMEM component that can manage things on behalf of all the applications it's managing. Um, we initially went with the user space approach for a couple reasons. Um, one, uh, user space allows us to get uh, more information about how applications are actually using memory. Um, we explored initially uh, actually interposing on higher level application memory calls like, uh, you know, malloc and uh, other application level things. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't end up actually exploring this idea, but the user space implementation uh, stuck around. Okay. Um, and exploring those higher level, uh, you know, C++ or other library or, or managed memory allocation calls is something we can also I'll look at in the future with this current user space design. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Um, we have another question from Abhilash, who's asking, what is the overhead of PEBS? Uh, how much slower does a load store become if it is being logged? Uh, so we don't really observe 
very much overhead at all with PEBS. Uh, there's an experiment set up in the paper where we, we break down the overheads. And um, when uh, with, with the PEBS lo uh, logging, the overheads are very negligible. Um, and let me just promote uh, Yongju to uh, panelist so he can ask his question. I think uh, Yongju is the one who's asking about the kernel. Did you have something to add? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, actually, yes, yeah, so, uh, my question already, but uh, if I can ask one more question, I wanna actually mention that like, yeah, like user space can have a lot of like application attributes or stuff like that. But also I personally think if you wanna support like like multiple applications co-running systems or like cloud or whatever, and I think you need to support also like C groups or like performance isolation or something, then I think like it would be interesting if you like, if you or anybody like implement like your ideas inside kernel, but also using application, I mean, user level resources using EBFF or something, Using EBFF, you can actually communicate with uh, like user level information inside corner or something. So I think it's be really interesting if you have any like idea about it or any comments on this, or it can maybe help other people to who want to do this kind of stuff inside kernel. Yeah, thank you. Uh, those are some interesting uh, points there. Um, so the the kernel approach again would give better like more default global views. Um, we argue you can achieve the same thing with a with a careful user space design. Um, I'm sorry, but there, there was another part to your question I'm not uh, remembering right now. Can you follow up? I mean, like, I, thought, I thought you mentioned like the user space I and mean, implementing this idea in user space is also great because like in user space, you can actually achieve a lot of application specific attributes. But also, I think like if we use like stuff like EBFF, we can we can also deliver such information inside kernel, and then kernel actually utilize such information in uh, memory allocation or something. I think that the, such collaboration between kernel and user space could be really interesting to research topic. But if you have any like ideas or comments on this, that would be helpful. Yeah, I think it it would be interesting. I think to look at that. Um, do you know the oh the overheads of the eBPF approach? Uh, actually, it really depends on the system, but I've actually used it, but it's really minor. But I don't know, like it's also kind of like CPU intensive. So you also need to consider that. But I've heard a lot of stories, like people are actually extensively using eBPF or inside storage or in or kernel or something. So I think it, it might be a really interesting topic. Yeah, I think that would be very interesting. So uh, thank you for pointing that out. Thank you so much. Great, thanks for all the questions. Uh, and thank you, Amanda. I know it's the middle of the night in Austin. <laughs> so really appreciate you um, being online to, to answer all the questions. Uh, and please continue the discussion on Slack. Um, and we will move on to our next talk. Uh, so our next talk is going to be about how we can use NVM uh, from Java applications. Uh, so we'll have uh, our next